Thank you for being with us. Our next speaker, and uh, really kind of a treat to end the day, is Dr. Francesca Dominici. She's the Clarence James Gamble Professor of Biostatistics, Population and Data Science, co-director of the Data Science Initiative at the Harvard T.H. Chen School of Public Health. Um, Dr. Uh, Dominici is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the International Society of Mathematical uh, Statistics. She's an expert in causal inference, machine learning, Bayesian statistics, leads a large interdisciplinary group of scientists with the ultimate goal of addressing important questions in environmental health science, climate change, and biomedical science. Her productivity and contributions to the field are immense. Her she has provided the scientific community and policymakers with robust evidence on the adverse health effect of air pollution, noise pollution, and climate change, and they have directly impacted air quality policy. She's published over 220 peer reviewed publications, is recognized in the most prestigious uh, media, journals, and uh, quotations. Her work is covered by New York Times, um, Times, Los Angeles Times, BBC Guardian, etc. She has multiple, uh, received multiple awards, and she's also, last but not least, and how timely and adequate, is a very big proponent of career development of uh, women. Um, she, at the Harvard School of Public Health, she led the Committee for Advancement of Women Faculty, and her work at Johns Hopkins um, University Committee on the Status of Women earned her uh, a Campus Diversity Recognition Award. Uh, Dr. Dominici will be talking to us today on data science for cleaner air, leveraging machine learning and causal inference to tackle air pollution and climate disaster. Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's absolutely a pleasure to address you all. Uh, and I am sorry I'm not there in, in person. I really hope to have an opportunity in the near future to um, visit you all. So thank you, thank you for the uh, for the invitation. So um, yes, I will be really talking about the, the intersection of data science and environmental and climate change policy. Um, and so I think first of all, I would just want to give you a little bit of the background, the fact that air pollution and climate change are pretty much two sides of the same coin. And sometimes when people think about climate change, they don't think about air pollution. And when they think about air pollution, they don't think about climate change. But it's really, they are very, very integrated. So first of all, the you know one of the reasons why air pollution and climate change are two sides of the same coin is that they have the same sources, whether it is um, traffic or, um, or power plants or pretty much anything has to do with fossil fuel combustion, both lead to higher level of air pollution, but also high level of greenhouse gases. So what it means here is that if we provide the data science and evidence, the strong evidence to control the ambient level of air pollution, automatically we are gonna target the sources of greenhouse gases. So we are not only gonna breathe cleaner air, which is lovely and it will improve our health, but at the same time, we are also gonna tackle the sources of greenhouse gases and, uh, and slow climate change. In the United States, so there is a very clear path forward to reduce the ambient level of air pollution, and that is the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act is a comprehensive federal law they authorized the Environmental Protection Agency to establish national ambient air quality standard to protect public health. Um, and so the law said specifically that if we found evidence that there is a adverse health effect of air pollution, a level above the national ambient air quality standard, by law, the national ambient air quality standard, they have to be lowered. That means they have to be more stringent. And in the United States, this is really an important time because the Biden administration is moving toward tightening the limits on the deadly um, air pollutants. So my work is to take the largest possible data, integrate them, harmonize, and develop statistical methods in data science to show that indeed the current level of air pollution is still harmful to human health. And so we need to lower, uh, we need to lower the national ambient air quality standard, which means we need to have a more stringent standard. 
One thing is incredible and powerful about data science, and I'm sure that this is resonate with many of you, is that when you have a lot of data, so first of all, there is not data science without data. Okay, so um, first of all, you have to think about large amount of data that are clean and are as accurate as possible, a uh, characterization of what's happening. Um, then if you have data science and if you have evidence that comes from data, it really provides in a very effective way to, to, change, to change policy and a policy that is effective. In fact, again, thank you, thanks to, to the Cleaner Act and the W Health Organization, when you have a in a policy that is informed by science, good change happen. You see that on the left, these are the ambient level of air pollution in the last 20 years. And you see they have been declining over time. And these are a picture of the skyline in Chicago. And you see that we have been breathing clean air. So things have been better, thanks to the fact that data science have been informing policy. I've been very interested to address a very specific question, which has a, three million, has a trillion of dollars ticket. Uh, and of course, if you address this question in the United States, you address this question automatically and inform other countries as well. Is exposure to fine particulate matter and air pollutant in the air, even when it's be below the current policy standard of 12 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, lead to an increase in mortality risk? And I said, this is really a three, several trillion million dollar question is because if we find evidence that a level below the 12 microgram per cubic meter, there is an increase in mortality risk because of the federal law, the Environmental Protection Agency needs to put stringent air quality standard. And so we breathe cleaner air and re, 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 reduce emission of greenhouse gases. So, as I said, as I mentioned to you, I am a strong advocate about the point that there is not data science without data. So it's silly to think about fancy data science methodology and fancy machine learning model without training them on the important data. Data is the intelligence part, right? So if you don't have data, you don't have it artificial intelligence, you have artificial stupidity, right? So this is really important. So we have been working for several years to pretty much try to analyze the entire national healthcare system in the United States. In the United States, it is not a, a national system for everybody, but there is for people older than 65. In the United States, when you turn older than 65, you are enrolled in the Medicare system. This is approximately 67 million people. We So then we have the entire medical history and their medical record for hospitalization from the year 2000 to 2018. So we have we have individual level information when they died and cost specific hospitalization. We have some individual level information. And most importantly, we know their zip code of residence. So we have been building for many, many years. So this has been really my, my career mission of over 25 years, continuing to build, update, refine the national data platform that has exposure to air pollution. And I'm going to tell you in a second a little bit more about that. Uh, but not only exposure to air pollution, but exposure to greenhouse gases emission, climate variables, um, exposure to uh, toxic chemical from power plants, fracking wells, and so on. That's linked to health data, which I mentioned, the Medicare population, and then several confounding information, because if we want to assess whether or not air pollution increases mortality risk, you also need to account to potential variables like confounding or concomitant factors that could vary with air pollution. One really immense uh, progress that data science has been allowing and enabling in the context of environmental and air quality is really our ability to better measure exposure to air pollution. So this is a map in the United States that shows where the monitoring station that measure pollution are located. And you can see that we are monitoring air pollution pretty well, but at the same time, there are areas in the United States where they are not monitored so well. And by the way, these models now, which I'm going to tell you in a second, have been providing better exposure to air pollution all in the United States, but all around the world, and I'm sure in, uh, in your country as well. 
So the idea here is to develop a machine learning model, actually ensemble learning. They're trained on the monitoring data and they're trained on the, the output of atmospheric chemistry model and they're trained on satellite images. So in one hand on the, on, on the left side on my slide, um, we have where the, the, the data is monitored we have satellite images so they give us an imperfect measure of air pollution we have output of atmospheric chemistry model and we have many other variables meteorological variables and land use variable we develop ensemble model learning we train the the machine on all of this information and then we provide and validate that and accurate estimates of exposure to daily air pollution of one kilometer to one kilometer uh, grid for all the continental United States. This is one I would say, not all in the United States, as I mentioned, but all around the world, this has been done now in the global south as well. This has been one of, I would say, the success story of machine learning, of really how our ability to have a better exposure to climate variable and air pollution variables. So here we are able to get pretty accurate exposure to air pollution, a one kilometer, one kilometer grid. Sometimes we get up to a 50 meter grid, thanks to my colleagues in the Department of Environmental Health here at Harvard. Uh, you see that we can get narrow, actually, this is, a, this is exposure to elemental carbon and ability to really measure elemental carbon you know, at the traffic roads. And then what we do, we link the exposure to air pollution to this health variable and analyze this data, both with standard regression approaches, but also with causal inference approaches. I want to mention two of landmark publication of, of the lab. One was in 2017. Well, for the first time, we will link exposure to air pollution and Medicare population for 60, 60 million people and really provide strong evidence that the current national ambient air quality standard for fine particulate matter were not adequate enough. So this is, was a gigantic data set. You see that we have um, uh, overall 460 million observation in this context are person years. So, so repeated measurements at individual level over time. We have uh, a large number of individuals. If you look at the last column of this table, you see that we have 32 million Americans that they are living breathing level of fine particulate matter below the safety standard, below 12 microgram per, uh, per, per cubic meter. And that's important because, as I said, if we show that they are experiencing adverse health risk, even where a breathing level of pollution below the standard, that means that we need to put more stringent, uh, more stringent re re regulation. What we found is, uh, if you look at just at this at the first column under PM 2.5, these are estimates of hazard ratio by feeding a Cox proportional hazard model. If you follow, if you just um, concentrate on the first uh, on on this first cell, you see that there is a number 1.073. What this means is that when we feed a Cox proportional hazard model and adjusting for confounding. We found that for 10 units increase of fine particulate matter um, is associated 7.3% increase in total mortality. Um, actually, if we found, if we restrict the analysis for people that are breathing level of fine particulate matter below 12 microgram per cubic meter, so these are these should be the ones that are breathing clean air. Actually, we found that the increase in mortality risk is even higher. Um, and so this is, was really strong evidence that uh, levels of air pollution, even below the safety standard, are harmful and increase mortality. Back in 2017, during the Trump administration, uh, these, these research had a lot of press coverage and also it was highly endorsed by one of our senator, Cory Booker, especially because I, as I mentioned, I'm gonna mention before, you know, in, a, in a minute, is we also find quite a racial disparity in terms of that we found that black American are experiencing higher adverse health effect associated with exposure to our pollution. One of the criticisms about our previous modeling and our previous data science methodology is that we fit just standard regression model. And you know that when you're adjusting for confounding, they're actually now better methodology. Uh, we call it methods for causal inference that what they do, they allow to take an observational study 
and try to approximate it to a randomized trial where instead of adjusting for confounding, using regression terms into a model, you're using matching. And so what we did, we reanalyzed the entire data platform using methods for causal inference. I'm showing you the citation because then you can learn more about if you're interested. And there is also GitHub that, you know, with, with all of the available code. So we have the same database. It's just that we have more recent here. Exactly, the, you know, uh, they, we have even more data now. We have 573 million personnaires and we have 38 million individuals. They are exposed a level of air pollution below the national ambient air quality standards. So similar data platform, just more, even more data. And as I mentioned, one of the most important elements when you're trying to estimate the adverse health effect of air pollution is to be able to adjust for confounding. And so you see that this plot shows that the correlation, uh, this is just absolute correlation between fine particulate matter and other pollutants like traffic pollutants or humidity or percentage black population temperature. And to be able to really disentangle what is the effect of pollution from other concomitant factor, matching allow us to really do exactly that, right? So if, if you're matching, for example, with respect to percentage of black in a zip code, you can look at the effect of air pollution on, on adverse health effect only for, for the people that are living in the, in the neighbor, they have the same percentage of black population. So we rerun the analysis, not only using regression modeling, but also using several models for causal inference, which I'm not going to be able to tell you in all of the de de details, but they give you the citation if you want to learn more. And so we use matching or adjusting or weighting by the generalized propensity score. And I mentioned the reason why matching is so powerful is because uh, if you just focus for a moment on the figure on your left, the red dots are what I showed you before, the absolute correlation between PM 2.5 and all of the other potential confounders. And the green dots are the absolute correlation that I get after I've done the matching. And you see that the absolute correlation in this represented by these green dots after I've done the matching is all very low, is all below 0 0.1, saying the matching allow us to take my observational study and try to approximate it as a randomized trial because I, I, I was able to break down the correlation between PM 2.5 and all of the other potential confounders. What we found by comparing both met standard methods for regression, but also existing a new methods for causal inference is actually that when you're looking at the fact of long-term exposure to PM 2.5 on mortality uh, for the whole population, you see that we found very consistent estimates around, as I mentioned before, 10 units increase of PM 2.5, long-term exposure to PM 2.5 lead to around 7% increase in all-cause mortality. What is very interesting that when you restrict the population to people that have been breathing level of pollution always below 12 microgram per cubic meter, we actually found two things. One is the mortality risk is even higher, so providing strong evidence that the current standard are not stringent enough. And then we found that when you have methods for causal inference, the, the mortality risk estimates, is a, it's, a, it's, it's definitely lower, but clearly still highly statistically significant and positive. So what we found based on this modeling is that the lowering the air quality standard from 12 microgram per cubic meter to 10 would save 143,000 lives uh, in one decade. Very important in causal inference, this also allows us to estimate the entire exposure response curve in a highly flexible manner. And you can see that actually this exposure response curve tends to have a steeper slope, a lower level, definitely a level below the national ambient air quality standard. And again, really providing evidence that uh, as you're lowering, as you're lo lowering the exposure to particular matter, the benefit, a lower level, the benefit is even higher. So we are seeing, we are waiting to see what the EPA is going to decide. They propose a new rule will actually be announced sometime this summer. And you know, of course, I didn't have enough time to go in all of these cruciating details, but 
you can imagine that in this context, there are a lot of unresolved data science questions. Uh, there are questions about uncertainty quantification and propagation. So for example, I told you that exposure to air pollution is estimated from machine learning model, and so it's not perfect. And we are working on a methodology to propagate that exposure error into the health effect estimates. Um, there are a lot of issues about causality, the, you know, issues about measure confounding. I show you an estimation of exposure response curve. And also there are a very interesting question regarding heterogeneity of effect. So who are the, the subpopulation that tends to be more affected or less affected by exposure of air pollution? And then in the context of informing policy, I think it's really key to think about re reproducibility of results. Um, some of the science that is produced by my lab is by no means just me, is actually the result of a phenomenal consortium of university across the country. Uh, different university are contributing scientific questions, are contributing data, are contributing software, and are contributing uh, additional additional me um, me methodology. And our program manager, actually, Leila, is from Lebanon. So what, what are the conclusions? The conclusion is that the steps needed to mitigate climate change in the future are substantially the same as those needed to reduce the burden of death and disability to, to air pollution in the present, which we need to cut back on burning fossil fuel and biomass. In the meantime, machine learning and data science allow us to measure exposure and pinpoint susceptibility and vulnerability. And methods for causal inference will allow us to better disentangle causes from confounder especially in the context of natural disaster. I always like to think about looking ahead and providing a data science perspective, which is really always remember that it's not data science without data. The focus on developing data platform is absolutely essential to do good data science and to make a positive change in the world. Um, I really think that there is a lot of intellectual um, need and input for linking spatial temporal data in all of these variables and really um, continue to stress the important effort of understanding the distribution of this effect in disadvantaged portion of the population. So that's the end of my talk and I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Dominici. This is fascinating. If I may allow myself to ask the first question, the impact saving lives is phenomenal. Um, is this translatable to other translated? Can this be translated to other population? Have you tried to evaluate the impact of such intervention in other populations? So um, there, there, are, there are a lot of efforts to, to um, I would say replicate this approach from, from and by, by this approach, I'm thinking the entire data science pipeline from bringing all of the data together and analyzing and informing policy in other country. Um, because um, I like to think, I like to say that first of all, lungs are lungs. <laughs> and we know that air pollution is adversely affect uh, people all around the world, and we know that actually many of the uh, the other country, the level of air pollution are much, much higher in the United States. So I think what I would love to, to see, and I've been personally involved, is really having now, now because we have the, the data, remember that the, the, the uh, satellite images now are available everywhere. Um, atmospheric chemistry model can be run everywhere, and there is access of computing everywhere. And so um, there are a lot of elements of this data science pipeline that can be put together, replicated in other country to directly inform their government about lowering exposure to ambient air pollution, which will have a two media benefit. One is, again, we all want to breathe cleaner air and be healthier, but also because uh, of the sources of our pollution are the same of greenhouse gases emission will really provide the global responses to the control of greenhouse gases emission. Absolutely. I wasn't thinking lungs are different. I was thinking in Lebanon, we have a very much higher proportion of smokers in addition to what you mentioned about pollution varying across populations. Um, 
let me see if there are any other questions. Yes, sir. We have one question. Cross-sectional uh, or longitudinal, or how does it go? I'm not a statistician. This okay. is the first one. So the first question is: He's interested in the causal inference model. Is it cross-sectional or longitudinal? Because the gentleman is not a statistician. Yeah. 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 No. Thank you. So, um, so a couple of points. So number one, these are longitudinal data. So these are uh, we are following uh, from from the so. In the United States, what happened is when you're turning 65, you enter in what we call the national health care system. And so as an individual turning 65, I can follow the individual and I will know every single hospitalization up to their, their uh, date of that. I know where this person lives up to a zip code of residence. And I know how much pollution the person breathed throughout their you know, from the moment they enter in Medicare up to their time of, of, um, of that. So these are longitudinal data. When you have longitudinal data, how you make um, assessment about causality is when we say, is pollution a factor for increasing the risk of mortality? We need to make sure that we are controlling from all of the other factors that could be both associated with air pollution and mortality. So actually your colleague pointed out a very important point, smoking, right? Smoking is a classical example. So what, what causal inference methodology allow you to do is to do matching for smokers. So for example, we can look at whether longitudinal changes in air pollution is associated with mortality among the people that smoke the same number of cigarettes every day, right? So if there is a relationship there, we know that is their pollution, but not the number of cigarettes they are smoking, right? So this is really the funda fundamental idea of matching. I can create, you know, 3 million people that don't smoke, 3 million people that smoke one cigarette, 3 million people smoke five cigarettes, right? And then I can estimate the relationship for each of them and then figure it out whether there is a still a relationship. If the relationship vanish, it means that it's not the pollution they're breathing, it's the number of cigarettes they're smoking, right? So that's really the fundamental idea how we go about it. Thank, Thank you. you. The other question is about, instead of uh, monitoring uh, mortality, uh, is there any plan to monitor longevity of a population in an area? So yes, yes. Well, you can... Um, you can, we can do either. Um, and because we, we know their, um, their, their age and we know their date of that. So in the same way we are looking at the increase of mortality, we can look at number of life lost. Um, and, and so it's, it's just, a, it, it, I mean, it's a, just a different calculation, um, but it can be rape reported either way right in terms of both of life number of of, uh, of years lost or mortality risk or longevity the gentleman longevity. is asking yes yes um are there any other questions okay i'd like to thank professor dominici for a fantastic presentation hope to host you in lebanon now that you also have a lab uh, leader in your uh, uh, lab with uh, from Lebanon. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for being here and invite Dr. Musawi to close a wonderful day of women in data science. Thank you, Dr. Dominici. Thank you. Thank you for having me.